Good morning, and welcome to Alliston Christian Reformed Church. We are here today as God's people to be refreshed and renewed in our relationship with God and one another. Welcome to those of you who are perhaps visiting with us today, and also uh, welcome to those who are watching from home. May God bless you wherever you are. Um, just one announcement to share, and I'm sure we've all heard by now, but I'll, I'll share it just in case. And that is that uh, we had a hard week as a community this past week in that we lost uh, one of our own, Jane Lagerway. And um, it's just sad. It was kind of a shock for her and her, uh, well, for her family. And um, yeah, I know that there are people who are mourning today and just feeling really sad. And so we will pray for John. We will pray for his children and family. Um, Jane's wake will be on Tuesday, 2 to 4 and 7 to 9 at Drury Funeral Home. And the service, uh, the funeral service will be held here in our sanctuary on Wednesday at 11 a.m. And so you're welcome to participate and in that. Brothers and sisters, please stand. We come as we are to God who receives us as we are, and he desires to bless us as we worship and gather in his name. Hear these words from Psalm 67, drawing us to worship today. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May God make his face shine upon us. O oh Lord, make your face shine upon us that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O oh God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. Let's pray. O oh Lord, today we join our voices with your people all over the world, every tribe, every tongue, every language, to sing glory and honor and praise to your holy name. Lord, as we gather here in our own little community in Alliston, we pray that you would come to be among us in a powerful way to touch, to bless, to heal, and to make us more and more like Jesus Christ, our Savior. Holy Spirit, we invite you to move and to do as you need to do and want to do in our midst today. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved of God, the Lord is with us. Receive his greeting for you today. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ May the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God has welcomed us to church today. Take a moment and welcome each other. Greet each other.
When we come into the presence of our great and holy God, our own humanity is laid bare. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehood and the idolatry of our own heart is exposed. I'd like us to take a moment um, to just simply quiet ourselves in God's presence, quiet ourselves before God, opening ourselves up to him. And as we do that, we will do so trusting in the promise uh, of the gospel that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So let's open ourselves up to God and just do some self-reflection, allow him to point things out in our lives that might need addressing. And after about a minute or so of this, we're going to pray a communal prayer of confession together that will be on the screen. So let's quiet and humble ourselves before the Lord. Together, let us pray this prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name, through Christ Jesus, Lord, amen. Let's uh, continue in this uh, humble posture and sing together Refiner's Fire.
good news from the book of Ezekiel. This is God's promise to us. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all the idols, your idols, I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. In Christ, this promise has been fulfilled. Come have a seat on the front steps, children age three to grade five. We have a special guest today who will be doing the children's blessing. His name is John Vandermeer, and he's going to share about his work. All right, good morning. Is it on? All right. So my name is John, and I work in a country in Africa, way in the heart of Africa, and it's called the Congo. And I have something here from the Congo. Do you want to see it? Now, what do you think this might be? A Bible. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about this. Does it look like a telephone to you? Well, it is. Can I show you how it works? Do you guys want to see? Okay. This is called a gudu gudu. Can you say gudu gudu? Right. Now the gudu gudu has two voices. It's got a high voice and a low voice. Now in the Congo, there are more than 200 languages. And their languages have tones. So a word can go from a high or low. Or it can go from a low high. Or sometimes the words just have to stay high. Or sometimes it has to stay low. Let me, now I had a friend, he wanted to go somewhere and he wanted to say, hi, I've come here to say hi. But he, he said, he stepped going like this, he went like this. And you know what he said? I've come to eat you. <laughs> huh? Is that the same thing? No, no, it's not. Okay, now I have a question for you. If Does God talk to you using a gudu gudu? Does he say, does he speak to you with a gudu gudu? Does he? Nah. What does he use? Now what's this here, a picture of? A Bible. On the front there's a carving of a Bible. Now Pastor Atulu gave me this a gudu gudu. And in the front of his... Uh, church is a massive gudu gudu. Show me how big. Stretch out your arm. Show me what big looks like. I think she got it. Yeah, yeah, it's about that big. And so what he would do every Sunday morning, he would he would beat this thing, something like that. I, I I don't know what I'm doing, but anyways, he would say, "It's time to get up. Time to get up. Wash your face. Wash your face. Time to get ready for church." And, and so everybody would get out of the bed and they start washing the face and, you know, put their dress on. And then he wait. He says, something like that. No, not like that. Anyways, um, he would say, now it's time to start walking to church. Time to walk to church. And so people would come. And he, it was massive. And it, it was sounds like boom, 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 boom. Oh, it's beautiful. Anyways, Pastor Tulu was part of the Bible translation team for the Mayogo. 
and he made the New Testament. And this is the New Testament. So he doesn't, the God doesn't speak to us using Gudu Gudu. He uses the Bible. So Pastor Tulu translated, uh, helped translate the uh, Mayogo. And right now he's working on the, um, the Old Testament. Now, I, you guys are pretty smart. I'm going to ask you another question. Now, if you guys wanted to talk to God, do you use the Gudu Gudu? Say, God, I have a, a question. Is that what you guys do? Well, what do you do? What? Ah, I knew you guys were smart. Yeah, we pray. So let me pray for you guys. Lord, we are so grateful, Lord, that you want to be called Abba, Father. Father, on the cross, you made it possible for children, big people and small people, to come to you and talk to you as a, a child to a father, because you are Father. And Lord, you have given us a Bible in our language so that we can hear what you want us to learn. So I pray, Father, you be with these young kids as they go through Sunday school, as they learn. Lord, may they uh, talk to you, and may they listen, and may they learn, and may they become more like you, Father. And I pray also for the many children in the Congo who are yet waiting to hear you speak in their language. So, Father, thank you for this time. Amen. Dear friends, we are in um, a long series in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is a letter Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in order to shed gospel light on the many issues, and there were many, many issues that that church was facing. And one such issue was what to do about food that had been sacrificed to idols. As we've learned, nearly all the meat sold in Corinth was meat that had first gone through the temple system in some way. This is how it worked. A worshiper would bring an animal to the front door of the temple and he'd offer it in sacrifice to the God he was trying to please. The priest would accept the offer offering, sacrifice it, and then offer a portion of it on the altar. The rest would be split up in, the rest of the meat would be split up in a few different ways. Some would be kept in the temple to feed the priests and their associates. Some would be given back to the worshiper to take home, and others would be sold in the restaurant nearby or the marketplace down the street. And the Christians who had had their lives changed by Jesus were wondering, can we eat meat that has, been, uh, gone, that has gone through the temple? There was a disagreement in the church. Some said yes, because of course, we know better. God is everything and idols are nothing. But others felt strongly that they were to keep their distance both from the temple and from everything that came out of the temple. For, at, for them, that whole system of operations was just too close to the way they used to live their lives before their lives were changed by Christ. So there's the situation. And into this situation, Paul writes, and he gives a remarkably nuanced and wise response. On the one hand, he sides theologically with those whose conscience is not pricked by the meat. Yes, he agrees, idols are nothing. But to this liberty, Paul adds an important caveat. Though the idols are nothing, your brother or sister's conscience is something, a big something, and you want to do everything in your power to support your sibling in the faith, and if that means foregoing meat that has gone through the temple, then forego meat that has gone through the temple. Love is more important than liberty. It's Paul's first point. And then in chapter 9, Paul nuances the discussion yet again, 
In that chapter, he talks about his rights as an apostle and how, well, he has them and the church has to provide for him. But then he says that he willingly lays these rights down for the sake of the greater mission of making sure that the gospel is proclaimed. And how this applies to the meat sacrifice to idol business is he's saying, look, there's something way more important than just getting your rights or having your rights met. What's way more important is that whatever happens, the gospel goes forward. Just as love is more important than liberty, so is the mission of God more important than liberty. So I've synthesized all this down to two principles so far, and here they are. Principle number one, my neighbor's journey with Jesus matters more than my liberty as a Christian. Principle number two, the mission of the gospel matters more than my rights as a Christian. And as we've seen and been talking about over the last couple of weeks, these principles are applicable to so much more uh, than just the matter at hand, food sacrificed to idols. These principles can apply to lots of other things in life that we have to make decisions on, like what to do with alcohol or what to do about Halloween or media consumption or whether or not to read Harry Potter or this book or that book, all these questions we have, these principles can apply. And in chapter 10, Paul is going to add a few more principles and offer some concluding thoughts on the matter. And it's to that we now turn. We're going to read, I'm going to read and reflect, read and reflect, uh, and we'll just walk through this text together. Hear the word of the Lord. For I do, not want you, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with that most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So Paul's reaching back to the Old Testament here, back to a formative uh, moment in Israel's history. And he's going to make the case that their situation back then is pretty similar to our situation today. Like we were baptized into Jesus, so in a sense they were baptized into Moses. And like we eat and drink bread and wine at the Lord's table, so they ate the manna from heaven and the rock, water from the rock. They didn't know Jesus like we know Jesus, but Jesus was nonetheless, uh, nonetheless with them in pre-incarnate form, just like he is with us now in spiritual form. But guess what? And here's Paul's point. Though they were in this privileged position as being God's people set apart, fed, baptized, uh, Christ with them, still they fell. 99% of them never entered the promised land. Verse 6. These things occurred as examples, goes, goes on Paul, to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. So there are all these like really significant moments in Israel's history in the wilderness wanderings. I mean, Moses went up the mountain to commune with God, and then down below, all the people gave their necklaces and earrings to Aaron and had him forge a golden calf for them to worship. And that night, they ate and they drank and they engaged in revelry, and the next day, God unleashed a terrible justice upon the camp. And then later in the wilderness years, the men of Israel were lured and enticed by the, woman, the women of Moab, and they engaged in sexual immorality with them. And on that day, another terrible justice, God's terrible justice was released on the camp. 
And at the end of it all, really, after all these years of wandering, there's really only two Israelites that get to enter the promised land from, the, uh, from when they left Egypt, Caleb and Joshua. Not even Moses was allowed to enter. You think that they would have stood the test, implies Paul. Are you so bold to think as to think that idolatry won't come to you too? It's one thing to eat marketplace meat. It's another thing to flirt with the temples themselves. So Paul is taking this Old Testament example and he's applying it to their situation. And he's saying, be careful. Be careful. This could happen to you too. Verse 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. Okay, so uh, to help us understand what Paul is doing here, I think we need just a bit more context. As previously mentioned, the restaurants in Corinth were often connected to the temples. And from what we can tell, they were basically like the fellowship halls right next to the sanctuary. And so you would take your animal in the front door, you'd engage in the worship service, and then you'd go have a barbecue in the fellowship hall right beside the sanctuary. If you think about it, it's kind of like what we do today. We worship, and then we drink coffee and eat cookies in the fellowship hall. And occasionally we even light a fire and cook some meat on the barbecue in order to celebrate all that God has done. And not frequently our service ends with a simple meal of bread and cup in which we have fellowship with Christ himself. So this is how it worked. The worshiper would enter. He'd want to give thanks to a particular God. Maybe he had a good harvest. And so I want to celebrate with my friends. I want to give thanks to the God. So offer the sacrifice. And then invite all your friends to the fellowship hall where you'd lift high the cup to whatever God you're giving thanks to. And you're inviting everyone else to join you in giving thanks and praise. So that's what they were doing back then. In temples of, in to Zeus or Aphrodite, they would eat and drink to nurture their relationship with that God. And what Paul is saying is, it's one thing to eat meat in the marketplace, it's another thing to enter the fellowship hall and lift high the cup of Aphrodite. The one is not idolatry, the other is. When Brittany and I lived in Grand Rapids, we used to frequent an Indian restaurant called Bombay Cuisine. Amazing food, but I was always a little weirded out by all the religious paraphernalia. If you've ever been in uh, an Indian restaurant, sometimes there'll be like fancily uh, dressed elephants here and there, or perhaps ornate pictures of gods or goddesses on the walls. Um, now, I think they were just trying to appeal to a Western audience by making it look authentic. So I doubt there was very little worship that was happening in Bombay cuisine. But imagine if Bombay cuisine was right next to a Hindu temple. And a one, imagine it was frequented by worshippers who had gone from the sanctuary to the fellowship hall. It'd be another thing to eat there and join them in raising a glass to whatever god they were worshipping that day. The closer you get to the front door of the temple, the more you flirt with idolatry itself. The Israelites thought they were standing firm, but they fell hard. That could happen to us, too, is what Paul is saying. Verse 14 so really driving the point home here. Therefore, dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks? The participation in the blood of Christ. These are the Lord's Supper elements here. And is not the bread that we break a 
participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we, though we are many, are one body, for we all share the one loaf. This is the fellowship hall meal. We are giving thanks to our unity in Christ. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices uh, do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and in the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Okay, so idols made of stone and wood, nothing, says Paul. He's going to go back to chapter 8 and say, idols are nothing, God is everything. But demons are something. Those pagan temples might not be filled with gods, but they are nonetheless a stronghold for the work of the evil one. Paul does not use the word, uh, the word demon very often, but he does often acknowledge the reality of powers and principalities that are dead set against God's work in the world. There is a power, Paul is saying, a devilish power at work in these pagan temples. It's not as though the gods are made of wood or stone or anything, but devilish powers work in these places to hold people in bondage. And these temples in Corinth, they really had a hold on people. They swept people up into their, into their orbit. Idols are nothing, but devilish powers are real. And I think we understand this. Think for a moment about the city of Las Vegas. There is a power, a principality at work in that city. I've never been to Vegas, but I, have, uh, I, um, but I imagine that there are many who get swept off their feet by the devilish powers of greed and pleasure that are at work in that place. If you were to go to Las Vegas today without an anchor, without the support of a Christian brother or sister at your side, it's likely that the devilish power of that place would just sort of grab you by the hand and walk you right to the main drag where you'd be tempted in all sorts of ways to make sacrifices to the god of greed or pleasure. Without an anchor, you'd be sucked in and spit out three days later with a nasty hangover and an empty wallet. Idols are nothing but wood and stone, but these powers and principalities, they're real. And we have to be careful about them. Another story, uh, kind of a, a, a tragic story. About a decade ago, an old seminary friend of mine took a call to the Pacific Northwest, Washington State. And there he passionately preached the gospel week in, week out. And then on Monday mornings, he'd go to the local yoga studio for a good stretch. Now, yoga is an interesting thing. It originated in India and has deep ties to Hindu spirituality. But not all yoga instructors or gyms major in the spiritual stuff. Uh, some are just in it for the stretching. And my friend was just in it for the stretching, which is totally fine and a healthy thing to do. Idols are nothing. God created the body. Stretch away. But slowly the spirit of the place began to draw my friend in deeper. What started as stretching turned into stretching and meditation breathing exercises, candles, etc., etc. Slowly, his fellowship with this place increased, and eventually the dissonance between his Sunday morning call and his Monday morning routine became too much to manage. And a few years ago, he called it quits on the ministry 
and called it quits on his marriage. Be careful. If you flirt with devilish power, sooner or later, later you'll find yourself breaking bread with demons. The marketplace is one thing. The front door of the temple is another. The fellowship hall is kind of between those two places. It can suck us in. Be careful, says Paul. Flee from idolatry, he says. And here's Paul's concluding thoughts on the whole matter. I have the right to do anything, you say. He's quoting from their letter to him that he's responding to. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. So be a good guest, eat what you're served. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I am, not, I am referring to the other person's conscience, not yours, for why is my freedom being judged by another conscience? In other words, this is back to the principle of, of mission and principle of, of neighbor love. Paul's returning to this. And if I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? And here's really the big idea, I think, that concludes this whole big matter. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause another to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that many may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So for Paul, this is really the heart of the matter. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Lots of things are permissible. Permissible. You have the right to do a lot of different things. God gives us tremendous amounts of freedom. You can watch Seinfeld on Netflix. You can watch the Super Bowl with a bag of chips and a tall, cool one in hand. You can go to Disneyland. You can take a month of vacation in August, which is five months away, but who's counting, right? <laughs> You have the right to develop an expensive hobby like seeing how many five-star restaurants you can eat at before you die. In the Garden of Eden, God only put one tree off limits. The rest of the world he gave to Adam and Eve. One tree off limits. Then at Mount Sinai, time to set the rules for the community, God only gave ten there are way more rules in the Salverta house, okay? Way more, but there are only 10. There is so much freedom. We have it in spades. We don't have to eat this. We don't have to do that pilgrimage. We don't have to pray at these times. There is so much freedom. But how will we use that freedom? Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. How does binge-watching Seinfeld help your neighbor in their journey with Jesus? How does eating out as, at as many five-star restaurants as possible further the mission of the kingdom of God? Many things are permissible, but not as many are constructive. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You know, so often we Christians approach our relationship with God a little like mediocre students trying to do the least amount of work possible while still achieving a passing grade. We want to see how close we can get to the line without provoking the Lord to anger or uh, raising flags for the elders of the church. You know, maybe if I come once a month, and I make sure to give a little bit of money, no one's going to ask questions, and I can basically live the life I want to live. 
But God sees the heart. And what does he desire of us? That we'd love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly with him. The greatest command is not, don't do this. It's do this, and that is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. These things, Paul's, you know, they're, they're first and foremost. And everything Paul has said about food sacrifice to idols could really come back to these basics of discipleship. Let's not be like the Israelites. Consider Jesus, Paul says, and he finishes with this. Consider Jesus and also consider me as I seek to follow Jesus. Jesus didn't fuss about the food set before him. He used it as an opportunity to connect with the people he came to seek and save. He told his disciples who were vying for power to knock it off, to become the least. He said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. Jesus used his freedom to glorify his Father in heaven, and he used his freedom to do the most constructive thing possible for the neighbors that God had given him. He laid down his life for them. He used his freedom to offer himself for us and for our salvation. In Paul's life, he was seeking to imitate Christ, followed a similar trajectory. Forsaking all else, he offered his body as a living sacrifice so that the world would know the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel. Follow me says Paul. Follow Jesus, says Paul. So I know that these, these chapters, they're long and a little bit convoluted at time, but I really, to wrap it up, let's come back to this idea of these principles, which I think can help us not just make sense of what to do with food, but what to do with so much of life. In conclusion, here they are. My neighbor's journey with Jesus matters more than my liberty as a Christian. The mission of the gospel matters more than my rights as a Christian. Flee from idolatry. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In all things, imitate Christ. Can these things help us live well for God in the world? They can. Amen. Let's pray. O oh Lord, life in this world, as you know, can sometimes be confusing. We, Lord, we don't want to simply be like mediocre students trying to do the least amount possible. Lord, fill us with your Spirit to empower us to do everything for your glory. And Lord, give us wisdom to live for you in this time and place, staying away from devilish powers that seek to throw us off. Help us to cling to you, Lord, and all that you are doing. And Lord, we want our lives not just to simply be about us and what's ever in, what's in front of us right here and right now, but to be to participate in your bigger story of salvation, of hope, of new life, of kingdom come. So we pray, Lord, that you keep us uh, forever fixed on that larger uh, mission and goal. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's respond uh, by standing and singing, Be Thou My Vision. Please stand.
At this time, I'd like to invite uh, John Vandermeer back uh, to the front to share a bit about his work. Uh, good morning. It's a hard act to follow, but... <laughs> Uh, my wife, Marion, uh, can't make it this morning, but she uh, sends you her greetings. As mentioned, we work for Wycliffe Bible Translators, and we are assigned to the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Congo, located in the heart of Africa, home of more than 200 different ethnic people groups, each with a language, history, culture, and art. More than 200 languages. Now, why is that important? Because I believe it's important to our God. Now, consider that day that the Christian church was born. It was Pentecost. People from many countries were in Jerusalem, and then God showed up through the Holy Spirit and spoke through the apostles. Now, God could have just inspired them to speak Greek or Aramaic, but he did not. God made sure that everyone could hear the good news in their language. Consider the end of times, Revelation 7. There's a throne, God's on it, Christians all around, and they can worship God using their own language and maybe even their own worship style. Jesus is calling different ethnic people groups from around the world to form one community, one body, his body, his kingdom, where all are welcome to a common table. Becoming unified as one and yet retaining our uniqueness. Is any of this possible? Humanly speaking, no, it's not. But that's the point. When it does, then the world will take note that something supernatural is happening and that's a God thing. Now, there's a temptation when ethnic people groups to adopt the language and the customs of the people that brought the good news to them. Bible translation means that God is now speaking to the people, these ethnic people groups, in their own language. Now, that's important. Instead of trying to imitate, they can now use the Bible to transform their culture. Not photocopies, but being who God has called them to be. In every culture, theirs, ours, they're good things. Some are so-so, and some are just downright nasty. But God will help them and us through his word, the Bible, to bring about the needed wholesome changes. Now, while the languages of these ethnic people groups within the Congo are old, they do not have a writing system. So my colleagues, both the Congolese and my expats, are really smart. Some of them are really big on uh, language research. There are others that are linguists. Some are gifted in translating the Bible. There are those that are in literacy, and there are those who engage uh, scripture. And my role on the team, I'm the media specialist. Media. Now, how does that fit in the picture? I know you asked that question. <laughs> Remember that these are old languages that did not have a writing system. So how did the elders teach the young people? It was through telling stories, through proverbs, through songs. So media then allows them to expand the effectiveness of their traditional teaching methods with the use of audio and video so that everyone in their community will hear the words of their translated Bible. Remember, not everyone can read. And not everyone that can read actually enjoys reading. So over the years, I've traveled on the trail bike throughout the rainforest to make recordings in the villages. I dubbed uh, films into their languages, and I've been building Android phone apps for the Bibles and songbooks. Now this May, it will be 30 years since we joined Wycliffe. Long time, eh? Wow. I'm not sure where, that, where, where the time went. But anyways, we've lived in Kenya, Uganda, and in the Congo. We raised our family there, and we've got lots of stories if you want to hear them. 
Um, but these last years, we've uh, received permission to work from Whitby and making the yearly trips back. This allows us to both honor and, and help our aging parents. Um, in Whitby, I have a, a, a nice spot to work from in front of a desk with three computer monitors. And from there, I uh, write um, training material and I create Bible apps. Uh, recently, I, uh, the Zimba Bible app and the uh, Kilega hymnal was sent to Google Play Store. Um, and then uh, in, uh, in March, I'm going to be starting the ba a songbook in Basande. And then in May or June, uh, there's a Bible app for the Mba Lese. And I got to update the Ndongo and the Bele app, Bible apps. But the main thing I'm really doing is training Congolese um, in media who are like young horses chomping at a bit. Uh, they're always wanting to stretch envelope. They want to do more in audio and video. And so they're keeping me busy, which is a good type of busy. If I turn around from my desk, behind me I have a big work table where I build and um, test out hardware. Um, in the years remaining with Wycliffe, my focus will be increasingly on the training and mentoring of Congolese media tech technicians. And you can help. Um, oh, <laughs> hello. Uh, that's me up there. <laughs> um, no, I lost my spot. Um, some years ago, we made an update, and I mentioned hammers and saws. And, and I asked the question, if I was to train people from different towns how to be a carpenter, hmm? and then you send them back and you wonder why they're not doing their constructions. Now the question is, could it be that they're sharing the same hammer and the same saw? So after the 2019 class, where the students I trained had to share the same hardware, I got almost no production from them. It was not good. Then Wycliffe uh, gave us a separate account called the DRC Media that gifts that are received in it can be used to, to buy hardware and for the training. So after the 2022 and 2023 classes, however, the technicians uh, could go home with the hardware they were trained in. And I've got like lots of productions coming. Uh, there are things like uh, recording of Bible books, uh, Bible stories, uh, folk stories, um, history accounts from elders, uh, interviews, songs, and now videos. Are they ready for the Grammys? Uh, <clears throat> nope, not yet. But they're improving. And, and, and quite frankly, I'm really proud of each one of them. So stop by the table downstairs in the fellowship room, and you can see some of the hammers and saws, some of the tools that these guys have been trained in or are using. And also uh, grab one of our uh, prayer cards. Even has a little magnet for your fridge. Um, and then you can remember to pray, not just for us, but for these media techs, but not just for them, but for all of us. Um, when you, and this is how you can pray too. Congo is a, a very interesting country, and the team that I work with are quite small, and we consider all that's being done, again, it's gotta be a God thing. But pray for wisdom, pray for uh, courage, safety, to overcome the many challenges that they have with their work. And safety too, because there's some like 120 different rebel groups in the area we work in. So many of the roads are no longer safe to travel on and some of the Congolese translators need to be relocated because of safety. And finally, uh, pray for my guys um, that we're training. Um, it's an uh, evolution, it's, it's growing, and uh, I got lots to say, but not the time. Talk to me afterwards. Um, and I communicate with these uh, media techs almost every day over WhatsApp. And I told them I would be here and sharing with you guys and ask them to pray for me. And uh, they just wanted me to uh, share you greetings. So greetings from the Congo. <laughs> and, and my wife and I, we also want to thank you guys at Alliston too. Um, yeah, 30 years. You guys have been walking with us, encouraging us, praying for us, helped us in so many different ways. And quite frankly, you know, we've been doing this work in the Congo together. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Hi. Uh, in the consistory room, I asked John what we should pray for, and he said, oh, you just have to pay attention. <laughs> and he wouldn't tell me anything else. So we'll see if I actually paid attention. So we uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for John. We thank you for his team. We thank you for his willingness and his years of service. We pray for him and his team. Lord, bless them. Keep them safe. Give them the wisdom and the knowledge they require. Give them the tools they need to share your word that the whole world may know that you are God and King of all. Bless our giving today. Let us share the good things that we have. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mani Rema. My name is Rema. I live in Congo and this is my house. Congo is a country with a lot of rainforests. It's one of the largest countries in Africa, about one fourth the size of Canada. I live here with my two sisters. And I really miss my dad and mom. They died in the war. Each morning I walk to school. I'm learning to read and write and I like that a lot. Our teacher is nice too. He says I can already read well. When I finish school, I want to become a builder. Then I can build houses for everyone. I love to play games with my friends, and sometimes we make our own toys. We also love soccer. After school, I work in our vegetable garden, so we have food to eat. We often eat cassava. That's a kind of vegetable that tastes a bit like potatoes. <laughs> Sometimes we make porridge from it or we grind the cassava into flour. Then we can make bread out of it. This is my fishing rod. I like to fish very much. With my sisters, we like singing praise songs together. There are already a few stories from the Bible in our own language. I try to memorize them. In school, I heard there are many more stories in the Bible. They are not in our book yet. Someday I would like to have the whole Bible in my own language. Thankfully, there are people in the church who are constantly translating new stories into our mother tongue. Then one day I'll have all the stories in my Bible, just like you. Thank you for sharing, John, from your work, your life, and allowing us to be participants in uh, the last 30 years. Blessings to you as you continue your call there. Brothers and sisters, please stand. As always, our service will... Um, after the service, you're welcome to join us downstairs for refreshments and fellowship. Um, also, if you'd like to be prayed for for whatever reason today, you're welcome to come to the front here. We, there'll be people here to pray with you. Um, God has been with us, and he sends you out with his blessing today. May God go before you to lead you. May God go behind you to protect you. 
May God go beneath you to support you and beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we all said together, Amen.